Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar on using consumer intuition to power your innovation process. I'm Joe Ridholm, editor of Quirk's Marketing Research Review. Before we get started, just a few quick notes. A copy of the slide deck and a link to the recording of the event will be available after the webinar if you'd like to share the information with your colleagues. And there will be time for questions after the presentation, so feel free to submit questions as we go, and I'll do my best to get as many of them answered as we have time for. Any of the questions that we don't get to today will be answered offline after we're through. Our host today is Bob Woodard, who has 34 years of experience in marketing, marketing research, and analysis and sales at companies such as Campbell Soup Company, the Coca-Cola Company, and Frito-Lay. Currently, he's a partner in Deep Marketing Alliance and Executive Vice President of Advertising Effectiveness at the Advertising Research Foundation. And with that, I'll hand things over to Bob. Take it away, Bob. Thank you, Joe. I'm really pleased to kick off this webinar for my friends at Quester. Um, during my years leading a global insights team on the corporate client side, I worked with Quester to develop unique, deep consumer insights for a number of projects. Some of these projects involved existing brands and products, while others concerned new products. Some covered U.S. businesses, while others covered international businesses in North America and Europe. In every case, though, Quester defined comprehensively the landscape of ideas and considerations that were most important to the consumers in the broad topic area we were researching. They also identified critical connections among these ideas and peeled back the onion for those that were most important, vividly describing and profiling each one. Finally, they provided really well thought out recommendations for applying the learning. My internal clients as well as I were consistently impressed by the quality, depth, uniqueness, and usefulness of Quester's contribution. Now, in, in my view, two things made all of this possible. First of all, the solid intellectual foundation in linguistics and psychology provided by Quester's late founder, Dr. Chuck Cleveland. I had the good fortune of knowing Chuck, working with him on our early projects with Quester, and learning from him about things like syntactics, semantics, and pragmatics, and why all of this made any difference at all to marketing. Second, but probably even more important today, are the strong skills and practice disciplines, the deep passion and the ingenuity of the team at Quester not to mention their marvelous approach to client service. Now, today we're going to review a new study that brings to life the Quester approach. It addresses a topic of high interest to consumers and marketers alike, health and wellness among younger consumers. The study actually begins with an in-person ethnographic research study commissioned by Quester and conducted by an outside firm. The valuable outputs from these ethnographies became inputs for Quester's unique process. Now, you know, traditional post-ethnographic survey research would normally convert the qualitative findings into discrete sound bites and then determine which ones represented views that are broadly held across the population, develop some basic descriptive segmentation, and maybe test a couple of concepts. Quester's approach was really different. Through deep interviewing and exploration by Socrates, that's Quester's very intelligent software-based moderator, and through the rigor of linguistic analysis and quantification, the Quester approach provided a whole new, vast layer of deep insights and ideas for action that complement the initial ethnographic findings, and also that extend significantly beyond those findings. I think you'll find this study demonstrates a great way for you to ramp up your marketing research process for innovation, especially at the opportunity identification stage of the funnel. It also illustrates a powerful and cost-effective way for you to improve significantly your return on investment for qualitative research you might already have in hand, like one-on-one -on -one depth interview transcripts, ethnographies, and the like. Now I'm going to turn over the program to our presenter, Nicole Klinkenbeard, Research Manager at Quester, who will take you through her study on using consumer intuition to power your innovation process. Nicole? Well, thank you, Bob, for the 
wonderful introduction. It's much appreciated. Hello, everybody. Uh, I want to take a moment to thank our research partners on this project. So a big thank you to Ipsos Observer and GrooveShark for helping us out with sample. And thank you to Fusion Marketing Power for the great work they did with the ethnographies portion of this work. So thank you, everyone. A little bit of background on Quester. Quester has over 30 years' experience in the market research industry with quite a breadth of experience across categories, including uh, CPG, pharmaceuticals, uh, banking, finance, um, insurance, and healthcare, to name a few. What really distinguishes Quester, however, is that we have some unique capabilities relative to what we like to call our giant brain analytic teams who are trained in linguistic analysis. And in addition to our analytic approach, uh, also our proprietary software. But ultimately what makes Quester different is that we give our clients the depth of other qualitative approaches with the addition of quantitative support because we can talk to so many more consumers. So the recommendations we provide are actually actionable, not just directional in nature. Quester's foundation is based in psychiatric interviewing, so really peeling back the layers to understand the thought flow process and how it ultimately impacts behavior. And these psychiatric interviewing principles were used to develop Socrates, our online software mod moderator who emulates a seasoned moderator by engaging consumers in one-on-one -on -one in depth conversations. So Socrates really listens to consumers and probes for further depth and understanding based on their thought flow. On the analytic end, our expert team of linguists leverage our proprietary text processing software called Aristotle. So it's really the combination of that human software analytic approach that enables us to uncover those themes, ideas, and nuances in consumer language and really translate them into actionable insights for our clients. So the agenda for today really revolves around talking about using a qualitative approach with a quantitative sample and how that can be applied to innovation research. The goal of this presentation is to look at where Quester can add value to the innovation process by really leveraging the brilliance of many, many more consumers in the marketplace and really tap into all the ideas and brilliance they have relative to innovation. We will also briefly present results from a case study we have conducted relative to innovation as it relates to health and wellness. So we all know that the best innovations truly come from consumers. Consumers alone have the true knowledge of their situations, how products fit within their lives, and they can really see the insights that no one else can see. It's really their in intuitions that are the ingredients in that innovation funnel, really helping you build a stronger foundation for that innovation pipeline. So really thinking about a consumer-driven innovation strategy. Early stage innovation research is the foundation for a successful innovation strategy. Really understanding where consumers come from in terms of their relationships with products is a crucial part of the foundation for innovation work. Traditional methodologies like ethnographies, focus groups, really do give you a detailed understanding of consumer behavior and can identify patterns that help you understand the relationship between your products and the meaning they have in consumers' lives. And they can also help you understand where there are gaps relative to those products, what the unmet needs of consumers are. But where Quester can add value is helping you unlock the ideas where all those pieces converge. So in earlier stage work, you get that detailed understanding of how products fit into consumers' lives, where they fall short, what the unmet needs are, but where do you go from there? What about true innovation, those ideas, those golden nuggets from consumers? How do you make that leap between 
understanding where the opportunities lie and developing products or changes that truly address those needs. And one of the keys to that is understanding both the obvious and latent needs of consumers. And the Quester approach to interviewing, as I mentioned, is based on psychiatric interviewing techniques to really unlock the latent needs and tap into the full intuition of consumers. So it's really more than just a series of questions. Our methodology is based upon the consumer thought flow and really peeling back each layer until you reach those deep thoughts and feelings that aren't always top of mind for consumers. So beyond peeling back all those layers, how do you know you're really tapping into all the potential intuitions of consumers, all the great ideas they have, and how do you find them? Talking to consumers in key research hubs is not going to get you all the truly product brilliant consumers out there. And we all know that not every consumer is going to have a brilliant idea. But the more consumers you talk to, the more likely you are going to find those consumers whose insights and ideas can really be leveraged into product or service development. And with Quester's online methodology, we can talk to many, many more consumers, really find those brilliant folks and, in addition, you get the confidence that the research truly represents the marketplace because we're talking to such large sample sizes with geographic representation. So the story is qualitative depth, really peeling back those layers with quantitative coverage, so talking to more consumers. So the more brilliance that you have going into that innovation funnel, the more you, ideas you have to vet to determine what moves on to the next stage. So Quester helps create multiple future possibilities for innovation that are completely consumer driven, thus raising the probability of your innovations being successful. So as an example of how Quester can add value in the innovation research process, We'll talk about a case study we did relative to innovation as it relates to health and wellness. Um, the full findings of this case study will be available as a white paper, but for the purposes of today, uh, we'll hit on some of the key pieces of information from this research. So the overall purpose of this case study was to utilize a mixed methodology. Uh, ethnographies and the Quester portion in this case, to really understand the evolution of young adults' attitudes and behaviors relative to health and wellness from their inception, so living at home with their parents, to when they're out on their own, those future primary decision makers, with the ultimate goal being to identify unmet needs and the nuggets of brilliance that can really be leveraged for product innovation. The first step of our process involved six ethnographies that were conducted by Fusion Marketing Power to listen to and observe the targets and really determine those unmet needs. And here the purpose was to understand what they know about health and wellness and what they do based on that knowledge. The second step involved 624 in-depth one-on-one interviews conducted by Quester software moderator Socrates. And the purpose of this phase was to use those psychiatric interviewing principles to really uncover both the obvious and latent needs and really dive deeper into consumer intuitions as it relates to health and wellness and the innovation work and in addition provide quantitative backing to the information found in the ethnographies. So sample, as you can see here, these six ethnographies were conducted in the Chicago area by Fusion Marketing Power, and then Quester followed up with 624 in-depth online interviews with young adults aged 16 to 18 who were still living at home with their parents or caregivers, uh, young adults aged 19 to 24 who were in college but no longer living at home 
and young adults age 25 to 30 who were not in college but were out on their own. And one additional thing I wanted to point out here was that while this sample was U.S. English speaking respondents only, Socrates also conducts interviews in Spanish, German, French, French Canadian, Portuguese, and simplified Chinese as well. So touching briefly on the overall findings to help set the context for this, this slide represents overall conclusions of the ethnographies and cluster pieces of research related to young adults' overall mindset and behavior when it comes to health and wellness. So as you see here, as young adults age, it's really a transition from living in the moment to a more broader scale, balanced outlook on health and wellness. So in that youngest cohort, ages 16 to 18, no surprise, they don't deny themselves the food they love. They're really more about living in that moment. The males are more likely to ignore the good habits that their parents established for them with, um, for example, fast food being incredibly important to them. Fast food is nirvana for them. They're always looking for that next big thing in terms of fast food. Females are more likely to choose healthier meal options but are more unwilling to give up uh, their snacking behavior for healthier options. As you move to that next age group, age 19 to 24, you start to see this idea of balance emerging. However, at this point in their lives, it's more conceptual in nature. They're really caught between the adult knowledge that they have and their youthful invincibility. And that 25 to 30 year old group, that balance we talked about really becomes the foundation for everything they do. They're really motivated by how a healthy lifestyle makes them feel both physically and emotionally and those better choices now that they're making now are doing for future um, outcomes. So they're really more future focused and how the choices they're making now can impact those future outcomes. So this slide was put together by Fusion Marketing Power and really gives you a detailed sense of the food choices they're making at each stage. So as young adults age, their food choices become more similar between males and females and also healthier overall. So with the teenagers, you see more differences. Males are all about the fast food. They're actually completely avoiding healthier options by choice based purely on taste. Females avoid fast food but are hooked on snacks like cookies and other sweets. In that 19 to 24 year old group, you start to see those more balanced choices emerging, uh, things like whole grains, lean meats, etc. However, these choices are limited by abilities relating to things like cooking and good old fashioned cravings they're more likely to give into. Um, and as opposed to those healthier uh, food options. At 25 to 30, those healthy choices are becoming more top of mind and important in terms of their outlook on a balanced lifestyle. That balance here, however, to point out, includes not denying yourself something you love. So they really have a better sense of being able to enjoy the things I, I want to eat, even if it's not healthy for me, but in moderation. So the rest of the findings in this deck are solely from the cluster piece of this research. As you can see here, attitudes regarding uh, diet and exercise become more positive as young adults age. Things like healthy eating habits being more top of mind and important to these young adults and exercising on a more regular basis. So eating healthy really is a balancing act for young consumers. They actually really do know what they should be considering when it comes to making healthy choices. And the factors that are most top of mind for them are things like choosing lower fat options, more natural, less processed foods, fresher foods, looking for lower calorie foods, uh, foods that contain less sugar. But making those healthy choices is still very difficult for them. There are certainly those cost and taste issues that play a role, but also this idea that it's simply hard work for them. 
And as I mentioned earlier, utilizing that psychiatric interviewing techniques, we really strive to peel back the layers of each idea. So as an example, let's look at hard work in more detail. 52% of consumers are saying, you know what, it's just really hard to be healthy and make healthy choices. So looking at the factors that make it hard for them. Part of it is simply a lack of willpower. Even though it's shameful, they can't break those bad habits, some of which are driven by convenience. They don't have time, don't make the time to eat healthier, so they are falling back on old habits. Others simply don't know how to cook healthier. They don't have their cooking skills, so they're falling back on things like easier box meals or frozen foods. So they're really limited by their abilities. If you look at the language here, I'm not a great cook, so trying to balance everything is difficult. I guess I never learned and I'm not good at improvising meals. I think eating healthier would be easier if I could cook. And there's also a large emotional impact to this. They feel guilty because they're not making the effort. It impacts their self-esteem. I'm disappointed by how little dieting, dieting and exercising I commit to. I'm frustrated that I'm stuck at a larger weight and sad that the effort is too hard for me to give at the moment. So as I mentioned, they really do have a fairly strong base of what eating healthy is. However, that knowledge they have clearly does not translate to action. In the red column here, you see ideas that consumers talk about regarding what they know about healthy eating. So what I should be eating, avoiding, what I should be looking for when making food choices. And the green column is actual behavior, what I do when it comes to eating well. So for example, paying attention to nutritional contents, looking at things like um, fat, calories, etc. 56% of consumers talk about this in terms of something they should be looking at. I know I should be paying attention to this stuff, but only 31% talk about it in terms of what they actually do. Same issue with things like fresh foods. They know they should be eating less processed foods, more um, fresh foods, but few actually follow through on that knowledge. So the so what, what do they want in terms of innovation? They want you to help them be accountable. They don't have the willpower, and in addition to that, it's simply too difficult for them to always know how bad or even how good something really is for them. So they really want you, they want products and services to really make things easier for them to make healthy choices. So the true innovation, the golden nuggets from consumers, these are some of the ideas that came directly from the consumers and really could be leveraged in some way for innovation. So dining out, for example, is a big issue for them. There's really not a lot of healthy options for them and the willpower that they lack certainly compounds the issue. 22% of consumers specifically talk about changes to the menu itself. So some of the specific consumer intuition, intuition, making a completely separate menu for healthy options. So you actually offer a choice of menus when they sit down, the regular menu or the healthy menu. You ask them which one they want and you don't even give them the other one. So what this does is it helps them avoid the temptation of looking at that juicy hamburger and fries when they're flipping through that menu to find that tiny healthy section buried in the menu. Again, it has to do with the idea of the lack of willpower. Listing nutritional information for each dish, not just the healthy option. Here it's that idea of the guilt playing a reverse role. If all restaurants had to put the calories on the menu, I'd have a hard time eating something with lots of calories. If on the menu it described the food option and put how many calories it was, I would use that to figure out what meal I would want. Also, showing pictures of all the healthier meals on the menu. Number one, this makes the section stand out. It doesn't get lost in that sea of yummy images of those less healthy options. 
And it also helps overcome that inherent association that healthier options don't taste as good. So it's really that images are linked to those taste perceptions. Portions are also a concern for consumers. Consumers find it difficult to only eat the amount they know they should. So they get this large portion in front of them. They know, you know what, I really shouldn't be eating all this. But that lack of willpower, they often finish the plate or eat to the point that they're stuffed. Others simply find that the portion sizes are absolutely ridiculous. They see no need for portions that large. So actual consumer intuition, the easy one, shrinking the portions. Or offer an a la carte menu so they can order only what they want, not everything that comes with the meal. They can really pick and choose the pieces they want, even if it's a less healthy option, but they don't have to uh, get the fries or choose to replace it with a salad. Or make it clear that there's an option to box up half the meal before it's even brought to the table if you can't shrink the portion sizes. So it removes some of that temptation to overeat. So shopping and cooking. Preparation is a big problem for these young adults. Many aren't making lists or talk about just not being sure what to put on shopping lists. So they talk about you know, I don't make a list, so I fall back on kind of my standard easier option, which again are often boxed or frozen type meals. So they suggest online shopping lists based on meal plans for the week. So maybe they can go to a website where they can choose a number of recipes and it generates a shopping list for them. Or at the shelf level with the main ingredient of a product something that will lead them to actually pick up the product. So they see a tear-off shopping list, for example, um, that utilizes this product in front of them. It's an easy way for them to, you know, help make the decision to make healthier cooking choices. Shopping is a challenge. I don't always have time to make a list, so I default to quick and easy things when I'm at the store. Maybe shopping lists on websites or shopping lists that hangs on the shelf. So again, they're looking for pieces that can help them make those better choices. As we talked about earlier, many aren't great cooks. So providing specific cooking instructions with products, including things like produce, like how to cook broccoli or how to make healthier foods more flavorful, flavorful would be helpful for them. I think this one here is a good example. Just learned how to steam broccoli last night. It would be helpful to learn more about how to cook all kinds of vegetables and what dishes each would be good in. I want to train my taste buds to crave veggies and fruit, not chocolate and fries. So tell me how to cook and how to make it more flavorful. Again, they want to be more healthy, that they just need help getting there. Recipes. Make simple recipes more accessible at the store. Not on the product, but at the shelf level, maybe even a store display somewhere. Um, also online is an option. Again, part of this is driven by the fact that they may not um, reach for a product on the shelf. So if there's a recipe on the package, they may not see it. Again, this is something that could entice consumers to actually pick up a product on the shelf. I think it would make things easier if I would eat more vegetables I like or learn how to make them more tasty without making them fattening. It would be easier if I could find healthy recipes that would include a lot more vegetables and make them a lot more enjoyable. So again, part of this is lack of knowledge and ability. They, they know they want to eat healthy. They may not like the taste of broccoli, for example, but they're, they're really looking for ways to make them more enjoyable and they're just not sure where to go from there. So as you can see here, while young consumers may not always be acting the part, health and wellness really is very important for them. And they want to be healthier. They just want help doing it. They want changes to be made that can help them make better choices. So that's all I have. And as I mentioned, the full findings from this case study will be available in a white paper 
but now we will open it up for questions. I think one of the first questions, um, can you talk about how the interviewing software works, you know, how it knows uh, what to probe and sort of what the user's experience is like with it? Uh, yeah, you bet. So um, basically, as I mentioned, uh, the Socrates uh, program was programmed using those same psychiatric interviewing principles we use to train our human moderators. So the system works kind of like an instant message interface. The, a topic is presented, and the interviewee provides a response. And then Socrates, the software, probes for further depth and understanding. Now, um, there are two levels of probing within the system. So there's a base functionality called dynamic probing. And this is basically um, built into Socrates' brain, if you will. And so what happens with a dynamic probing is Socrates takes a portion of their response and turns it into a question. And so there are hundreds of pre-programmed responses where Socrates can probe for, say, further definition. Um, you mentioned X. What does X mean to you? Uh, maybe it's rationale. I noticed you said X. Help me understand what makes you say that. Um, simple elaboration. Uh, tell me more about X. Or... Um, implication, help me understand what different X makes to you. Now there's also a second level of probing called targeted probing, and these are the probes that are developed for each individual project and topic to really um, drill down and ensure that we're addressing the objectives of the project. And in addition um, uh, to um, controlling the, the probing with these targeted probes. What happens is the system looks for a targeted probe first, and if one of those ideas is not triggered, it falls back on that automated probing. But we can also adjust the extent to which the probing occurs in the interview. We can um, dial up the probing in certain areas or topics, tone it down in others, shut it off completely, and so the experience is very conversational in nature, and everything is driven by the, the consumer response and really tracing that thought flow. Oh, great. There was, uh, one, there was one particular slide about peeling back the layers. Um, can you talk about how, how some of those connections are determined? Uh, yeah. So basically, um, the connections are determined by the analyst. So it's really... Uh, I guess a combination of the psychiatric interviewing technique to really um, get all that information we need as analysts to really evaluate the thought process, as well as our analysts actually breaking down all that information and ultimately taking those pieces, um, synthesizing it back together to really determine what those connections are and tell the story. So. We're also looking for things like co-occurrences when determining what those connections are. So um, what ideas occur together as we follow that conversation all the way through the probing and determining what that thought process is all the way through to decision making. Okay. We had one other question on Socrates. One, uh, attendee was wondering, is it a, a vocal or talking interface or is it, is it written? It's all written and typed. It works just like kind of an instant message interface um, or um, similar to kind of a, a texting process. Sure, okay. Are there uh, particular types of industries or products, I guess, too, that, that for which this type of approach might be most effective? I mean, could you use it for, you know, a B2B audience or something like that? Yeah, definitely. We do, we've done um, quite a bit of work with B2B. Um, one other thing I wanted to point out is that um, I've talked a lot about consumers in, in this presentation and um, relative to this specific piece of research, but we also do do professionals, B2B, um, also physicians, other healthcare providers. And when talking to physicians, for example, Socrates actually uses a different brain, if you will. So he talks slightly different to a physician, a professional, than he would to a consumer. Um, part of that being just the, the way that, that those type of people talk and the differences there. Okay, great. We 
had another question um, just about the text analytics. Does the tool itself have a text analytics component that then categorizes the comments, or is this done you know, later after the fact by an analyst? Um, well, it's kind of a, a combination between the two, and I suppose if I had to put, say, numbers around it, it'd be, I don't know, somewhere around 75% analysts and 25% are software. But really the key differentiator here is that the software is actually just a toolbox. So that 25% is really simply allowing us to condense the large quantities of data to be able to work with it more efficiently. So the key piece is really a data reduction tool that allows us to really comb through those you know, hundreds of interviews more efficiently. And the other piece on the back end of the analysis is um, after our analysts have actually determined what those key ideas are, what those relationships are, on the back end we have software that involves a tool to help quantify those ideas. So um, it's really the analysts are playing an incredibly large role in terms of the actual intellect here, but the software is ultimately a toolbox that helps us um, basically condense the data and deliver results in a much shorter time frame than if we had to actually comb through and read hundreds of interviews. Sure. I have one question, too, about just a little bit more clarity on the process of you know, how the most useful or the most brilliant or creative consumers are selected to include in the innovation process. Uh, well, in this case, it wasn't something we specifically screened for, although we have done something like that in the past where we're looking for a certain type of more creative consumer or even a more um, super articulate consumer, if you will. Um, but in this case, it's really um, part of, partly driven by quantity. The more people you talk to, the more of those kind of golden nuggets you're going to find sifting through all that information. And as I mentioned earlier, not everyone is going to have a brilliant piece of information, um, a brilliant idea relative to um, specific product development. However, their situation and their insight relative to how the current products fit or don't fit within their life cycle, uh, um, within their lives is still very valuable to understanding the entire situation. Can you make any broad generalizations about particular groups that are more creative than we might think or, or surprisingly less creative than we might think? I mean, or does it just sort of depend on each person's individual personality? Uh, part, partly dependent and also partly driven by the way we structure the questions and that, that kind of psychiatric interviewing technique where it, it doesn't necessarily feel like you're sitting in the couch, you know, inside a doctor's office, but really the way we structure questions and the way the probing works to really get people to open up and, you know, start to talk about things that, you know, maybe that wouldn't have been top of mind for them. So it's really a combination of factors and maybe finding those product brilliant people and um, really digging in with the interviewing technique to get other people to really open up. Sure. Can you talk about just generally what the main benefit of is of this method versus a standard procedure? You know, is it, is it a lower price to get a larger number of responses, or are there other benefits to having the sort of psychologically rich answers that you get this way? Yeah, well, uh, uh, the, main, the main benefits being the depth of data with the, um, the quantitative support in terms of numbers, but in terms of price and timeline, there's certainly benefits there. We can field a really large study with, um, say, consumers. In this case, 624 we fielded in roughly um, five days, and we've done it. Uh, and that was um, going after a fairly difficult target, especially with those, those teenagers aged 16 to 18. So um, it allows us to collect the data, number one, more of them and faster, and reach some more um, hard-to-get uh, consumers, if you will and time-wise do it quickly, and in addition, our um, analytic tools allow us to um, uh, speed through that analysis portion faster and deliver results faster um, because of that software and the efficiencies it gives us. Sure. I think you touched on this a little bit in terms of some of the languages that Socrates can interview in, but we had a question about that. What, which countries can this research be conducted in? I mean, would it just be dependent on if, if that language is spoken? in a particular country? 
Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, using English as a, a simple example, um, so um, British English, Australia are also included in those slightly different, um, you know, nuances in language. Um, you have your French, what I'll call French French, and French Canadian. Um, so it just depends, uh, yeah, basically um, where we're talking. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about the role of ethnographies in the process and what the information gathered from the ethnographies you know, brings to the whole, uh, the whole process? Yeah, well, the, definitely the eth ethnographies play an incredible role here in terms of you know, the overall um, you know, landscape in terms of how products fit into their lives and um, you know, starting to touch on what those unmet needs are. And what we did is we took the learnings from that and incorporated it into our interviewing process to really build upon the things that we learned about, about um, in the ethnographies and using that psychiatric interviewing technique, really peeling that back a little farther and really starting to get at, say, for example, the emotional impact of some of the decisions they're making and, you know, how that ties in with the knowledge level they have, but, uh, you know, the guilt, for example, they have on not acting on that knowledge and those sorts of things. And also, as I mentioned, really digging deeper into those um, potential innovations and really asking them to think about those types of things. Sure. Well, I think, oh, actually, here's another one. Um, oh, I guess, uh, can you talk about the, I guess, the client that funded the case study you presented? Is it a restaurant, a medical association, a food company? Nobody actually funded this research. Um, Questor commissioned this research, and um, our partners um, helped us with, um, you know, certain portions. Zip Soaps, Observer, and Groove Shark helping us out with sample and fusion marketing power with the ethnographies. So it's really a group effort. Sure. Well, I think that's all the questions we've gotten uh, in so far. I guess if there are any others that come in. As I mentioned earlier, we can uh, you guys can answer them offline. Um, and I'm not sure if you have anything else to add, Nicole. I don't think that so. We appreciate the opportunity, and thank you all for your time. Sure. So, um, again, I'd like to just thank Bob and Nicole and Quester and all of you who attended today. We hope you found the information interesting and helpful. And uh, thanks, and enjoy the rest of your day.